Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design Deducts Podcast. Our guest today is Jonathan Jewell. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi there, Darius. Great to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. That's fantastic. So tell us about you and your work. Okay. Um, I guess one of the things about my work is um, I've only recently come into the design education field. Um, I think I've had a very, very varied life um, up until now. I've been involved in quite a lot of different um, disciplines and areas to get to um, design. And I think uh, one of the things I found when I met with you, uh, originally left Aris, was you were talking about design, design education. I was really excited because I thought to myself, hey, this is an area I want to get into. But I guess, although I might have looked at things like innovation and considered myself in design before, I, I, I really consider myself probably um, an educator or somebody who's out there to try and make a really big difference in terms of making sure that people's human potential come into place. And I think it's only been recently talking to you um, and Frank, actually, uh, Frank Peters from the uh, from the Charter Society of Designers, that I've started to really actually get a, a handle on what really design education is about and as, a, as in the people in the field who are playing with that kind of thing. But my background, originally, I, was, uh, I did a degree in psychology. I went into teaching and nursing. I then started getting involved in all the different things around systems um, and innovation that was going on over in the NHS and to do with blended learning and all the developments that you would think would be very, very important around now, looking at global structures, ways in which um, you get, you know, you're able to communicate and bring education out wildly and bend, you know, uh, modify, kind of bring things together from different perspectives. And then I went to a stage where I returned to academia from professional education, got involved in doing more of the psychology stuff to do with things like ergonomics and human factors, cognitive science, into the philosophy, and eventually made this jump into the kind of uncharted realms of art. Um, I did an art theory and philosophy uh, qualification at Central St. Martins. And at that point, I think things really changed. I didn't think of myself, I guess, in the same engineer, you know, an engineer is like a serious designer kind of thing, someone who's actually doing this hardcore stuff and science was the big thing. I started to recognize the kind of like the, these definitional things, things like we often talk about to do with the difference between an art school and a science school not just a matter of like something being a disorganized kind of like messy place where you have great ideas versus this kind of high tech, really clever, systematically organized laboratory. I started to see these things coming together more. And I think that is where I started to get more involved and sort of like spread out my interest into things which were more like design education as I guess we see it in universities, but also keeping a bit of a distance from that. Um, Partly because I, I guess, you know, I, I didn't grow up around people in, in my adult life where I was really speaking design terminology. So I think, you know, I don't want to think of myself as an interloper. I'm trying to integrate myself and become part of like, you know, the art schools and that. But I do still feel a kind of separation. I was never in art design as it is spelled out in the curriculum as a young person. I always thought to myself at school, hey, I'm doing, you know, the serious stuff that involves math, that involves, you know, microscopes and telescopes and the great big scientists in past, not that area. And that's, I think, the possible not straight answer to the thing is because I am starting to think about the definitions of where does one part of that role and when does the other begin, or perhaps even where doesn't it really end and how do you kind of cope in that, that sort of interstitial space? Fantastic, fantastic. So, yes, we're going to talk about your multidisciplinary role uh, a bit later on, of course, because uh, that, that's what's extremely interesting about what you're doing. Uh, but tell us about the latest projects you're working on. Okay. Um, I mean, my days are very, very varied. At the moment, I'm teaching in several universities. I'm teaching quite different things because I try to maintain my um, professional background from previous things and just kind of add in new things that I'm learning. So with the Open University, I've taught quite a few different areas and I still teach within STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. I teach within the uh, diploma scheme and the stuff to do with the access modules for that. Um, 
but I'm also teaching at the Open University stuff that relates to developmental psychology and child and youth from my time when I was a children's nurse for many years back, and now getting involved in teaching on the design courses, which at the university they call, that they code them as U courses. Now, U is supposed to mean that it is a university-wide subject. So U101 is design that theoretically comes into any degree, but obviously to different extents, it does or doesn't come into that. I also teach at the University of London, where I teach programming, um, introduction to programming for undergraduate first years, but also the masters in data science and machine learning um, finance, uh, and financial um, programming. Um, I teach with um, uh, Chester University, where I'm involved in computing and project um, work that's going on over there. Um, and I'm involved with the uh, Association for Learning Technology, looking at um, technological approaches to learning um, going forward. So you know, that's sort of like quite a wide range. But then I have my kind of professional interests as well. I'm doing quite a lot of stuff on regenerative um, sustainability. I'm involved teaching with the, uh, although at the moment because of student numbers and of these adjustments, I'm not actually teaching on the course. I'm still involved with the London College of Fashion and I'm still involved with the uh, Fashion Retail Academy, working on things which are relating to sustainability or whether or not different kinds of ways of thinking can help move us into regenerative territory. And so I'm working on development with some other people who've been involved in the movement towards sustainability fashion to challenge some of those ideas. And in those places, I'm more on the business and economic side. Uh, within the courses, there are a few kind of mixed things. I'm working on building, building a ternary computer within Minecraft, which is a project which is kind of to illustrate to students that you can use uh, virtual locations, physical locations, and try and replicate some of that area. And I, I'm running a new series of seminars for um, undergraduates and postgraduates, trying to bring them together from different areas that takes them through learning software engineering, learning how to start off building some computer games, but within three weeks, a matter of seminars, to be actually modifying browsers like Chrome or changing like approaches to how we might use, you know, Fortnite or Minecraft to maybe develop neural networks and things. I've got the blockchain thing next week, doing, uh, which is basically talking about how blockchain can actually influence society. As I teach within the social sciences over, um, uh, over the Open University, things like, for instance, can the fact that it has it, that blockchain is immutable, that is, it cannot, um, you can't change it because it's like held on lots of computers and it's locked in mathematically. Could this be an end to ideas like history being written by the winners? Because theoretically, if it can't be changed, then history is written by everybody who is writing at the time and it can't be hidden or taken away. So there's quite a lot of projects. Some are very, very specific. Um, and they might be very technical, but they're also a little bit different to the ways that people are teaching. And there are other ones which are very, very general new applications of things. Um, and other projects are kind of, I guess, because I teach, there's routine teaching and there's looking at teaching and trying to think, how have we done this from an area? Like, how could I take ideas from chemistry, which I would have done when I was doing when teaching biology and science? How would I use that to explain to someone how a social model works? Or how could I use an analogy from this or from that, or a particular narrative or mindset from another area to try and wrap subjects around individuals um, and what they're trying to experience. So taking that student-centered kind of thinking a bit further by using this kind of different perspectives. Great. So on your profile, you use the term post-disciplinary rather than uh, other terms, uh, multi-interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. Uh, what uh, what advice can you give us on how to overcome the issues of working between disciplines? Yeah, um, I think one of the uh, one of the things is when I was doing nursing, and I'd kept track with nursing. I started off as a nurse, changed into a nurse educator, was involved very heavily in the Royal College of Nursing, and then moved into innovation at the Royal College of Surgeons, and then I've been in innovation roles within universities. One of the things I think that really um, I noticed was this original start out right in the 90s where we were talking about things like, let's have people talking with other people. 
like the nurse talks with the doctor. And it wasn't that this hadn't been something before, but it was very much about let's kind of give it more recognition that there's a kind of equality. And then it became let's have teams talking together, this interdisciplinary. And then it moved into this transdisciplinary where we're not just talking team to team, not just exchanging between teams, but we're cutting through all the teams. And I think always this seemed to me to be a big problem. And I, I never really figured out what it was. That I mean, in some ways it's words, but I thought it was something actually quite different that was like a lot of the problems in this. It wasn't necessarily where we were focusing, saying their language is different from yours. You need to understand their language and things. But it came to me during a, a design talk, actually, by uh, when I was at CSM to do with um, the socially responsive design. And we were talking about migration. We talked about very many projects about people going from one place, going to another and having these problems of adapting. And it was at that point I really had a bit of a change. I mean, I was doing... Um, I was doing art theory and philosophy, and we'd seen all these kind of terms being used. But I think the idea behind this post-disciplinary thing that I thought was actually a fundamental shift, and I'd been working across lots of different areas for a long time, is my thinking. And, and, and as I say, the term itself isn't so important. It's the concept that comes with it, was the idea that you're always an outsider until you're not, which is like kind of obvious. But if you've just arrived in a place, if I arrive in somebody's house, Forget like I arrive in somebody's country or if I arrive in a new neighbourhood, until I become part of that neighbourhood, it doesn't matter what communicating I do because I'm always the other person. I'm always not in the discipline. Mm -hmm. I actually went back and thought about quite a few of these things. And I looked at the way people were talking to each other and I noticed that there was a kind of... Um, I think in psychology, they call this the thematic vagabonding. That is, you jump from theme to theme and across there. And I often find people like in an innovation or design role, when I'm talking to them, they've heard of a great thing somewhere. And blockchain is the most obvious one um, at the moment in, in my head. They've heard of this blockchain thing and it's great. They know that they want to use it. They've read a couple of lines and they've seen the last line of the text that said something about it's got great potential, who knows, in the future. And without knowing anything particularly about it, they're looking around to try and find how they can use it. And what I found is that, like, almost when they come into the other places, it's not even just a question of, like, language and things like that. It's that they come in expecting that they can get the information of people, that they can work between teams gathering the information of the various people, and then they can just put it together without even going to that age where they thought to myself, I don't know how the community works over. I don't know what the experience is within this. And I don't know how these bits fit together. And part of the reason for doing this blockchain discussion is because I kind of think I'm a little bit knowledgeable about blockchain, but I'm definitely not an expert in that area. But rather than say, this is my new idea for blockchain, I kind of put out onto um, LinkedIn this thing saying, I wonder if this would be it you know, an interesting idea. And the person who's actually doing the blockchain thing has invited me to come there and do a discussion with him so he can expose his thinking on, you know, how he works through this problem. And to me, that is a much, much more interesting way of actually finding it than him just giving me the answer. And his interest in telling me the answer it exposes a kind of protocol analysis. It tells you how he's going through the thinking and the mindset. And he doesn't solve necessarily my problem instantly because he doesn't know the social science or the logic on my side that's going on here. And we're not going to get that across in, you know, in, in the discussion. But we are going to get to the point where I can think to myself, ah, oh, well, this is a weakness that I won't be able to understand. In a bit like the same way as I don't know where the bathroom is when I go to someone's house. I know what a bathroom is. I know what, you know, I can use that thing if I can find it. But there's no sense of orientation. There's no sense of that. And I think that's often missed. I've invited people, I've talked to people, sorry, who have asked me to introduce them to someone and they've run over there very much with their preconceptions and they kind of listen, but without the orientation. And they, you know, as I say, it's gone beyond language. It's gone, you know, when people talk to me about art schools of the past and I'm sitting in central St. Martins, I'm like, well, this is an art school, isn't it? And it's an art school to me because it's the big art school, isn't it? You know, but in another way, people go, it's not really like an art school. When I talk to somebody who's been in an art school, 
the first person who said, do you know about central St. Martins, when I was totally, as much as you can be, totally scientific, my first response was, Central St. Martins, oh, is it that big embroidery school in the middle of uh, London down in Hoban? I literally had no idea what was inside that place. And by the time I got there, it was more like what you see now, which, you know, to those who've been before, there's no kind of recognition of that in, in the same way. Wimbledon's held up as being more like the model. But, you know, this is the sort of thing I had no orientation. It was, it's an embroidery school with the best I could remember because I know my friend's mum had gone there, even though I could talk about characteristics because mm. I was really that blind. So you, you're, you're like a T-shaped designer where you have sort of a breath and you have also a specialism, yeah? So how do you relate all your uh, wider approach to design and design education practice? So I think that there's different ways. I think one of them, uh, when I was in the first year at university doing psychology, I remember... Um, My, the the stat, statistics lecturer, who everybody hated these classes, not because he was a bad stats teacher. In fact, I think it was quite inspirational. But a lot of them were very, very frightened. It was much more, there was a large number of people who were not coming from a mathematical background who came there to learn about dream interpretation and psychoanalysis, um, which, as you can tell at the time, I was thinking, uh, you know, dream interpretation, psychoanalysis, that's not real science. But when I got there, the, the, the stats teacher, I remember very clearly, he said, um, what you need to think about in terms of psychology, put aside these kind of worries about statistics, but you've got to approach problems with this sort of cycle of open-minded scepticism. That if you've got to have these massive dreams, these ideas that could be as ludicrous as you like, the kind of things that we, you know, we see like commonly now with things like uh, looking at techniques, for example, like the six thinking hats, things that I saw later on, the six thinking hats and different kind of focuses, you know, foci on these things. But at the time, this idea of open-minded scepticism, for me as a young person meant, kind of like, or I'd only just arrived at university, I didn't have that many experiences, and my open-mindedness wasn't actually that great. It was kind of, as you can tell, I wasn't willing to consider the arts and psychoanalysis was a load of nonsense and this, that and the other. I had very, very narrow impression from not having travelled. So I think one of the biggest things, and it's also on the skepticism side too, is when I hear someone come over to me with a massive kind of genius idea that they've had, which is all about science, For instance, somebody who approached me, who was quite young, said, uh, I'd like to set up a company that makes walking, talking things like Alexa, but they can talk perfectly and they walk around and they follow you about and they help you out. I can, that's an exaggeration in terms of the kind of example, but I could already say, actually, this problem, you know, being sceptical about it, I could see that this problem had much greater depth to, you know, you would need to know much, much more. It is not like a small project because I would have a full awareness of actually that there is this situation over here. It would require this program, the state of the art is at this level. It's going to be difficult. And open-mindedness, on the other hand, because I've seen things like often I see an innovation in a particular area, I think to myself that people are saying, we, we, we're nowhere near this. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, actually, We were doing that eight years ago in another area. So I think that's been a huge difference, the ability to know where things aren't and where things are and to help people to cast their open-mindedness and their scepticism in terms of that. I think that helps people get to realistic. But how this all this is related to design and design education? I think that's what I'm saying in terms of design and design education. In design, you do have this same kind of attitude when you're looking at things like double-loop learning. When you're looking at things where you're trying to go and get an impression of like, uh, I mean, one of the books makes sense where you're looking at actually, can you reconfigure the room in such a way that you're not like maybe sitting in the same place or the objects have moved around? Uh, you know, maybe I can go outside to get inspiration or flick through books. Uh, um, an interesting one I think I saw in one of your earlier podcasts was that Google finds things really, really quickly. And that if you find it really quickly and directly, like I think the example is a picture of a tree, you don't end up looking and exploring other things. You've got to that answer straight away. And I think, as I say, because I have enough breadth to come up with things which are not just, which, which I've seen from other places, not even necessarily imagination, but the exposure to so many things, mm -hmm. 
I'm able to see what is possible quite readily and also build on ideas from different disciplines, mm-hmm. bring them together and assemble them. Like, how would we make a loom when I work with people? We will look at different ways that aren't even considered yet. And, and likewise, the opposite way, that things are constrained as well, that I know whether that will work and whether or not, if it, if it won't work, then there's no point in then saying, let's build on that and make it even more crazy exciting because the first bit isn't within our current scope at the moment. Fantastic. So you, you're experiencing teaching in many universities. If you could, if there were no limitations, uh, what would you do differently in, in, in your teaching? Um, I, I think there are quite a few things which are largely kind of um, administrative based that would be quite useful. I think there is um, particularly, again, with these big ambitions that people have, and they come to me and they sort of say, I'd love to do this incredibly big thing. I sometimes think to myself, actually, this is boring. But if you did this, you would actually get through a lot of those problems. A thing that I saw that was fantastic at the British Computer Society, uh, the British Computing Society, their professional body, is when wikis had established with, they ran an event called Wiki Wednesdays, where they decided to organise their audience as a wiki to look at, you know, flattening and, and giving people the opportunity to contribute. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. But since then, I've had people approaching me about blockchain. And saying, could we do a blockchain type event where we organize the teaching room like a blockchain? And I'm like, probably. <laughs> I mean, I don't know enough about blockchain, but I could look into it. But there was a lot of other stuff you could do before that, which would just be better. Like, you know, maybe get your internet connection fixed, you know, before you try and recreate this. Um, and one of the ones I was talking about the other day with this blockchain person, uh, the one who, uh, Troy, his name, uh, oh, Send you the link later if you're interested, uh, once it's been done. One of the things I thought was very interesting is we were having a chat the other day about the thing we were going to do. And we've been talking about a medical kind of uh, startup, which has been talking very much about how do you use blockchain in terms of medical records? And we were discussing the multitude of ways this was going to be very problematic. It was going to lead large amounts of work to being put in. And I said, well, you know, the best innovation I think I've seen in recent years And I think this is a major problem, particularly in fashion, where they're really very gimmick focused in a lot of innovation. One of the things I think was really amazing was this bunch of people who were students. They went down to a um, stream, which was a canal, I think it was, which was full of rubbish. And what they did, they were supposed to clean this thing out and be innovative, but a very, very broad brief. What they did is they pulled in a whole load of plastic carrier bags. And being fashion students, they wove these carrier bags into a net, which they attached to a branch, which they pulled the stuff in. And then they scooped the stuff out. And I look at that sometimes, and I look at some of the innovation groups in fashion, and they've got this hologrammatic, absolutely lifelike thing that you can click a finger and it's got an audio sensor, which changes the clothing. And I'm like, these people just fish some plastic bags out the thing. That, to me, is a really clever innovation. Huge constraints without any of this thing. And it's actually something that will be here tomorrow as well as a potential. I mean, that one itself won't, but you could see that idea propagating in the same way that things like wheels do or things like, you know, pens and pencils do in a way that you're not going to probably be that excited about the hologram you look in the mirror at in 10 years in the future, unless it's being used in a very particular way. Um, so, yeah, I think in terms of education, I think sometimes the priorities are wrong, whether it's for kind of proving that you've designed something crazy, exciting is far more important than sometimes just doing something that's amazingly useful. Um, and the focus is a lot on the technology rather than that. Yeah, so what, what, what would be uh, the right priorities for you? I think that education within universities, number one um, priority. I don't know if you know Bloom's taxonomy, which is a, often that cognitive taxonomy where you work from the bottom up. Bloom's taxonomy, in my view, has always had too much priority by itself. And that is that a lot of people don't recognize or know about it, but there are three Bloom's taxonomies. One is about looking at the cognitive dimensions, which universities have been addicted to. 
there are two others, one which is about, you know, behavioural kind of like kinetic motion and the other ones are about stuff to do with uh, more of the emotional kind of like development of people. And I think these have always been disjointed in universities. I haven't been in an art school. I've come from a very different direction, but I've gone through all science training. It was only when I reached art school that people started to talk about this. And even within the art school, I always saw this as far lower priority than anything. Bloom's taxonomy would come up in every teaching thing. The stuff that Bloom's traditional taxonomy would come up there and it would be written about everywhere and people would grab those things. I think that's one big issue. I think the second one, I say this often to fashion people about the way in which fashion has been organised as a is been organised is a lot of uh, the approach to having new things come in to take advantage of potentially science grants or to get tech in and make art looks more useful because you know maybe it will attract more attention or maybe it will raise the status. I think it means that a lot of people have concentrated on hey, where can we get the best bits from from elsewhere without recognising that art really has some pretty amazing things going on and in fashion particularly. I find that they would rather pull in top quality business courses and business professionals from elsewhere and spend a lot less time on growing its own research from bottom up. So things like Doctor of Business Administration, where you're actually concentrating on what it's like in the workplace, you know, of fashion and what's going on in fashion in its particular ways, or learning about, for example, what it is in design rather than modifying ideas that are coming from sort of like richer areas, bringing them in or modifying things that come from science, philosophy, which is of a very particular kind. It's quite, as I say, a a lot more structured in many ways than many of the things that I've seen in art. It's certainly not, you know, art and design. I'm not saying that that is like typical, but scientists spend a lot of time walking around with the love of this idea with the goggles and the uh, pens sticking out their pockets that they're kind of like some boffins when they're not talking to artists and then suddenly <laughs> there's this transition to something which is a bit more superior other times and I think in, in many ways a lot of the people I've met within art in the early stages at least of my career in it have had a deference which I don't think is necessarily due and which isn't necessarily shared um, outside, and it would be better if there was a parity, some level of which people are actually communicating and working um, on things and saying actually that in art is remarkable and should be influencing our practice rather than grabbing a few sexy words or sexy ideas and applying it in areas where maybe actually the knowledge is very, very different. And thank God it is, mm. because you know, without it, you know, where would science itself be? Or where would art potentially, you know, how far could art have gone in terms of new things like digital and design? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, in, in the arts right now, there's a bit of an emphasis on how something looks rather than the values that it's being inspired from. And this is the discussion yeah. that, that we're not having right now. And we've got to have more of that, that something, yeah. something is like that because even, even unconsciously there are values behind it. We Absolutely. Look at that. Yeah. And one of the things I'd mentioned to you before was about this idea about axiology. The idea that axiology, which is the study of value, is formed, and most people, a lot of economists look at it and go, oh, you know, axiology, this is about money. Actually, axiology is a bringing together what is good in terms of the notion of ethics, but what is good in notion of the word aesthetics. So it's aesthetics and... Um, you know, value is defined in terms of, as philosophy thinks about it, as being about good according to phenomena and experience and good in terms of ethics. It's actually quite far away from the other things. And I really think that both subjects need to have a kind of a discourse about what is value and what value is going to be and what, you know, what things about that we look at. Because I think until we have that, there won't be a real bridging. You'll always be a stranger in someone else's community wherever you go. There won't be this shared thing that says, I am wise when I appreciate. You know, we've gone beyond information and data and even knowledge in many ways. But we won't actually be wise until we kind of have this sharing and we can actually talk to people about what a common sense is rather than you know, necessarily, you know, that I think that it's better that I can measure something to 
10 to the minus 9 and you think to yourself, actually, it's more important, you know, the experience and the feel of these things. You know, and we just respect those things which are really at the heart of human experience. And that's fantastic. Value. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So... Any, Do that one day. <laughs> any, any last words of advice? Um... I thought well, there's nothing sort of like particular I would um, sort of like say, except really get to know. It's not, you know, as I say, there are a number of places where I think you can have experiences and become less of a stranger. And I think at certain high levels, that's like really, uh, it becomes more difficult because there's a kind of level of territory. I think for students, though, the opportunity to really go into workplaces on internships and see other areas It's really underused in terms, apart from thinking that they're going to go into a coffee making role or do something that's boring because they have to, there's potential to go way, way beyond, I think, just going into a traditional design environment mm -hmm. and seeing things in a range of environments. And I hope that there are more of these kind of things where people say, you're going in there, you might think there's nothing relevant, as some people say to me, and I go bang, 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 listing off my experiences of that area. And they go, wow, I'd never even, you know, in a sense, seen any of those things in the same way that, you know, you hear people look at paintings and they can't see anything. And then they're artists and they see everything. I think there's a massive underestimation of the potential of being junior in someone else's field mm. and having to see it without being judged or expected to show off about their skills. And if we can help people to see that early on, And people would start doing this bridging, is my view. And I know people who do, and they are fantastic now they're graduating. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much for coming, Jonathan. Thanks so much for your time. No, problem. no thank you very much for the interview. Take care.